So it's my pleasure to open the uh, session number five on physical therapy and introduce the, the two chairs, uh, Colleen Jones-Down, physiotherapist from the center in St. John's, Newfoundland, and, and Susan Van Oosten, the nurse in the adult center uh, here in, uh, in Halifax. I'll pass it over to, to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So as David says, my name is Sue Van Oosten, and I work alongside uh, Sue Robinson in coordinating the Adult Bleeding Disorder Clinic here in Halifax. Um, and it's my honor today to introduce a young man who demonstrates the lifestyle and health that we as healthcare workers and professionals uh, dream for, for our, for our patients. Some of you may recognize him as Mr. Universe from a few years ago in hemophilia today. Craig Walker was born on November 2nd, 1981, and he comes from a very large extended family of those with severe hemophilia A. And I noticed that the population of the, uh, of the actual conference just increased fivefold because his family all arrived down here. So <laughs> welcome to you all. <laughs> Uh, Craig works at his family business and a, as a manager at Livestock Feed and Supplies. And to me, that means a lot of heavy lifting. So he has to be doing something right. Craig is a motorcyclist, and a motorcycle enthusiast, a scuba diver, and he has completed a Mud Hero Challenge. I'm not sure I really wanted to tell you that, but I, but I did. But most importantly, he's a husband of Michelle, and a father of little Lily, who's, who are both here, by the way. I just met Lily. Please welcome Craig Walker, who is here to enlighten us on the benefits of physical fitness and living a healthy lifestyle as a person with severe hemophilia. Thank you, Sue. Good afternoon. My name is Craig Walker. And I would like to thank Sue Van Oosten and Dr. Robertson for inviting me here today to share with you my experience with physical fitness and being a severe hemophilia. First of all, I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce myself. As I mentioned, my name is Craig and I have severe type A hemophilia. Hemophilia. Many people label as a disability. I never have. Instead, I see it as an ability. An ability to enjoy the good times to the fullest, to be proud and appreciate what I have done, can do, and will do in the future. Sorry. Many people take for granted waking up in the morning without joint pain or being able to do the simple things in life. Standing, walking, straightening a leg, or having the flexibility to bring your hand to your face. Might seem simple, but like many with a bleeding disorder, I spent many days not being able to do these simple actions. I stand here before you today as a very healthy, outgoing, active, 33-year-old father of a beautiful two-and-a-half-year-old girl. And I'm proud to announce we are expecting our second child this December. I'm an avid scuba diver and motorcyclist. I enjoy almost all outdoor sports, and alongside my father, as Sue mentioned, I proudly run my family's small business. I can honestly tell you I've never found anything I couldn't do as long as I was willing to work at it. I did not get to where I am today alone. I come from a hemophilia family. My grandmother, Mary, gave birth to her first son, who tragically lost his life at a young age. Later, it was determined he passed away due to internal bleeding. My uncle Dwayne was a severe hemophiliac. My young grandparents had never heard of the disease, and many people today are still not familiar with it. But when their next son was born a few years later, also with hemophilia, they did what they had to do paving a path for my family to follow. My grandfather, Colin Craig Sr., a retired RCMP officer, founded the Prince Edward Island chapter 
of the Canadian Hemophilia Society. My grandparents did the best they could with the resources available at the time to raise their son, Colin Jr. I am lucky to be able to tell you they are still here today taking care of us, even if I do have to take credit for some of their gray hairs, <laughs> or in my grandfather's case, lack thereof. <laughs> I guess you could say, although I never admitted to him, I watched and looked up to my Uncle Colin. Growing up, Uncle Colin was and continues to be a stubborn man, and so am I. Don't ever tell us we can't. Colin's dream was to be a police officer. Many laughed at him and told him that this would never happen, but it did. Uncle Colin was a Charlottetown police, a Prince Edward Island police officer for 20 years. He worked hard to get there, and although the career took a toll on him physically, he made his childhood dream a reality, and that taught me a very important life lesson. We have had many talks about needles, bleeds, and the pain that we experience. Colin even let me practice using a butterfly needle on him when I was learning home care. I never said he was bright. <laughs> to this day, Colin's an uncle I look up to, and his advice will always be appreciated. My cousins James and Colin's daughter Olivia are also severe hemophiliacs. James has recently been accepted into medical school, and Olivia is a very outgoing, active teenager. For me, they are both inspirational. They show me what a great, full life we are all able to lead. My parents have always been my biggest supporters. My father, Dale, started and successfully ran a small business to support my two sisters and me. He was always able to provide us whatever we needed and never was too busy to drop what he was doing to drive me to the IWK for an infusion. My mother, Pearl, she's my hero. My earliest memories are that of my mother holding me in her arms while I suffered a severe bleed, probably in my right knee, ankle, or elbow. She would rock me in the living room for hours upon hours singing me old country songs and telling me it would be okay. And I knew, as long as she was taking care of me, it would be. I remember visiting a hematology clinic at a young age and my mother speaking to a nurse about me riding a bicycle. She was told that it may be too dangerous. Once we get into the car, mom asked me if I wanted to ride a bicycle. I said yes. <laughs> I'll never forget the blue and white BMX bike or the great memories I have biking with my neighborhood friends. Another visit, I asked about ice skating and I was warned my ankles wouldn't take the trauma very well. I was advised against it. This time, I asked my mom if I could get some skates. She looked at me and said, Craig, you heard what they told you. I responded, but I know I can do it, Mom. She reluctantly purchased me ice skates, and although I did suffer a few good bleeds, I learned to skate, and I still enjoy it very much. My mom is my hero because she's my biggest supporter. She never stopped me, but instead stood with me and helped me achieve my goals, no matter how crazy or far off they seem. Mom still does this today, and for that, I am grateful. My wife, Michelle, is actually the reason I'm here today. About seven years ago, she told me she was going to join a local gym and asked me if I wanted to join with her. I told her I did not really see the need, but after finding a couple of membership was only a couple dollars more than a single membership, <laughs> we joined together, and we started going three nights a week. The first time I walked into the gym, I saw all these in-shape people doing crazy exercises and lifting crazy heavy weights. I did not know what to do. I was intimidated. I finally picked up weights only to find I couldn't lift them. Then I tried machines and found they hurt my damaged joints. I felt like people were staring at me or laughing at me. I was wrong. They were all at the gym for their own reasons, just like me. I was determined and I knew I could do it. I just had to find the right way for me. So that's what I would like to stress to all of you today. You can do physical exercise. No matter how bad your muscles and joints are, you can improve them. I took my time, started slowly, and found out it worked good for me. For example, cable machines, which use resistance, would often hurt my joints, causing bleeding. And lifting heavy weights caused my elbow to bleed. 
So instead, I begin by using high repetitions, which is the number of times you lift the weights, and I use lighter weights. I listen to my body and to my joints. I learned very quickly, as do most who exercise, if you push too hard or try to do something your body can't, the result will be injury. That's definitely not the result anybody's hoping to achieve. A typical gym night for me is as follows. 10 minutes of cardio, usually on an octane or elliptical machine. I choose one of these because they are a lower impact on my joints, which means less chance to cause the bleed. I follow this with a mix of the following exercises. Bench press, incline dumbbell press, hammer press, flies, curls, tricep extensions, rows, shrugs, leg press, leg extensions, chin-ups, lat pull-down, shoulder press, etc. I'd like to go into detail on a couple of what I believe are the more important exercises for me. First is a tricep extension, or a he-man as my childhood physiotherapist at the IWK would call them. In an attempt to get me to do this exercise as a young child, she would compare it to when the cartoon hero He-Man would reach behind his back to pull out his sword. I wish I listened then. A tricep extension is while holding a controlled weight with one or both hands behind you, you slowly lower it down and raise it back up. I had great difficulties with this exercise due to the damage done from multiple bleeds into my right elbow. But this exercise has greatly improved both my range of motion and strength in my arms. Curls. A simple exercise everybody knows and most have done. Selecting a dumbbell weight that works for you, simply curl it slowly. This is great for overall arm strength. Legs. Yes, legs. Talk to any guy or girl who goes to the gym. Nobody likes working out their legs. Try doing it with a bad right ankle and right knee. The biggest trouble I found was my left side was always trying to take the weight from the right. Unfortunately, this did not build even muscles. And more seriously, there was a potential for injury or trauma to my good joints. For instance, the very popular and effective squat, which, while having weight on your shoulders, you squat down and back up, I find very hard to do. And I've aggravated my knee trying to accomplish this very basic and popular exercise. So instead, I use a leg press machine, which, while in a seated position, you push an evenly managed set weight using only your legs. Also, a leg extension machine, which, in a seated position, you use your legs to lift set weight. I find these two exercises in particular have helped strengthen and build more muscle on my legs than I've ever had before. I had and still have a hard time doing many common exercises, but with patience and a never give up attitude, I found what works for me. My chicken legs, they thank me for it. <laughs> Another great exercise is yoga. Yoga is a slow, low impact art of pushing your flexibility to the limits. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Without bad joints, we don't have flexibility. And you're right. I find many of the moves near impossible to do because of lack of range of motion. But again, this is where listening to your body comes in. I do what I can and I modify what I cannot. I find yoga great for joint pain and overall improving my range of motion. I started going to the gym to support my wife and her goal to be more physically fit, but it changed my life. I used to suffer two or three severe bleeds a year to now not even one. I cannot honestly remember my last severe bleed. When I do suffer a bleed, my recovery time is much quicker. I have less joint pain than ever before. Making your joints and muscles stronger is our number one defense against bleeds. Don't get me wrong, when I have a bleed, it sets me back greatly at the gym. I have to slowly rebuild that muscle and regain my range of motion. But believe me, it's worth it. I only wish I started regular exercise 25 years ago. I encourage not just those of you here with a bleeding disorder, but all of you here to do some kind of regular exercise. I promise it will change your life in so many ways. Your sleep, your appetite, your energy, your mood, just to name a few. It will have a positive effect on every aspect of your daily life. I did not start going to get big or look ripped. I did it and still do it seven years later to better myself, 
to live a healthier and fuller life for my daughter, for my wife, for me. It has given me that and so much more. I live an active, busy, and happy life. And if it wasn't for my amazing family and the great support of my hematology team over the years, I would never have got to this point. And for that, I am forever thankful. Thank you all for allowing me to speak to you today. I hope some of what I said today hits home for you. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I'm easily reached. If you ever have any questions, concern, you just need a little bit of motivation to get started. And remember, hemophilia can be your ability. It just depends on how you look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And we do have a few minutes for some questions. And I have one, and that is, did you leave Michelle way behind a long time ago? Because I wouldn't want to keep up with that. <laughs> we fought a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from anybody? Come. Oh, he told them everything the they hook. wanted to hear. Off the hook. Off the hook. Okay. Thank you very much, Craig. So I'm going to resist the urge as a physiotherapist to get up here and say, I want everybody to stand up and stretch, because that's what I really want to do as a physiotherapist in this up-in-the-front situation that I'm in right now, but I'm going to not do that. <laughs> I'll remain seated. Um, I just want to say to Craig, I want to package you up and put you in my suitcase and take you back to Newfoundland and take you out of my suitcase every time I go to clinic, because that was amazing. There's no many, I could say that a million times over to my patients, but coming from you, it's invaluable. So I think um, all the physiotherapists and other health care professionals in the room um, found, we found ourselves nodding, especially the physiotherapists. And I think the key thing that you said was um, that you took it slow. And I think the other important thing is that you, you had some guidance, you know, to help you problem solve around how to do things, because um, I think that's really important in how we have to individualize. Exercise is very important, as we've heard uh, from some of the other panel members here today, but it has to be done in an individualized manner, uh, under, with the help or guidance of their healthcare professionals. So thank you very much. That was excellent. So I have the great pleasure of introducing our next uh, speaker. Her name is Karen Strike, and many of you know her. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Karen Strike many moons ago before hemophilia, before her hemophilia days, after my initial hemophilia days. We worked together um, at McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton. So Karen is currently a physiotherapist in the Hamilton Niagara Regional Hemophilia Treatment Center. Um, she has a degree in kinesiology, master's in physiotherapy uh, that she received in 2002, and I believe it was then that we met each other because you came to work at McMaster Children's Hospital, right? Um, she uh, is her principal research area, as we all know, those of you who know Karen know she's heavily involved in research. Uh, her main areas of interest are with musculoskeletal uh, deformation. Uh, musculoskeletal lesions and repair, uh, and of course, most recently, rehabilitation and point of care ultrasound, which we're all very enthusiastic about. It's very exciting stuff. She's a very experienced uh, speaker and has presented uh, on the topic of hemophilia uh, globally. Uh, she's a guest lecturer at McMaster University. The, the list is still going, there's still lots more here, so stay seated. Uh, she has uh, been she, was, she received the Clinical Health Professional Research Award from the Hamilton Health Sciences in 2013. And she's currently the pre president of the Canadian Physiotherapist in Hemophilia Care and is doing a fantastic job, I might add. Um, and I'm uh, very proud to introduce my friend and physiotherapist, Karen Strike. And she's going to speak to us about the new Canadian educational resource on smart choices in sports and activities. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Colleen, and thank you to the program committee for giving me an opportunity to come and talk to you a little bit about uh, hemophilia, sport participation, um, and individualized assessment. Here are my disclosures. 
And so what I want to talk a little bit today is I want to talk about um, the problem of universal limits on sports and physical activity and delve a little bit into the literature and the current research that can help us explain sports participation in people with hemophilia, um, outcomes related to vigorous sports, personalized treatment, and then I just want to conclude to help empower critical thinking and sports selection, which helps form the basis of a new educational resource that the CPHC is working to put forward this year. So what is the problem of universal limits? And when we talk about universal limits in sports and physical activity, we're talking about the categorization of sports that we've all previously seen in the past when we're looking at sports categorized in different groups or levels. And so this is all common sense to most of us in the room that you know sports that are in the green or level one category are the sports that um, are considered to be safe for most, if not all, patients with bleeding disorders. And those types of sports are your sports like swimming, hiking, archery. Um, and then in contrast, we have on the other end of the spectrum um, sports that are considered red or category three sports. And those are sports that are considered to be um, significantly risky for patients with bleeding disorders. And those are sports like cycle, uh, sorry, BMX biking, boxing, wrestling, ice hockey. And then in the middle, we have this gray zone uh, of sports that um, are suitable for some people with bleeding disorders, but not for others. And it's that gray zone that really um, promotes a dependence on healthcare professionals to advise and direct patients with, with bleeding disorders to help them help try and figure out what sports are suitable for them. And with that process, the person with hemophilia may really lose that feeling of autonomy when it comes to selecting physical activities. And we all must be aware that there's different ranges and abilities in our patients and different joint health presentations. And so not all ratings and categories for the different sports um, are going to be applied to, to each person universally. So this question of universal limits, I think, that we all now know is not the way that we should be looking at sports. And so I wanted to look at the literature and what was the literature telling us. And so to help me prepare for this presentation, I just did um, a, a bit of a search strategy. You all know that I work with Dr. Iorio, so this is um, in, embedded in us in our clinic to be quite um, robust in how we look at things. And so um, I did a literature search of PubMed, Ovid, Mendeley, and the Cochrane Library under the keywords of hemophilia, hemophilia A, B, sport activity and participation, and I looked at um, was there any randomized controlled trials, cohorts, meta-analysis, systematic reviews, etc., looking at patients with hemophilia A or B with no exclusions and to see if there were any outcomes reported um, in terms of joint outcomes and bleeding outcomes in relation to physical activity and physical activity choices. And so what the literature search found, uh, they identified 67 articles were identified through the database. I screened 26 articles, and there were really only six articles that were relevant to pertaining to sports activity and joint outcomes or bleeding frequency. So I'm just going to take a moment to go through some of the articles and what they found. And it just helps illustrate the point, and I think Craig did it very well as well, is that these categories or universal limits um, are based really upon some expert opinion that the literature is going to show us may not, um, may not actually hold true. So in a study by McGee that was just recently published in Hemophilia this year, they looked at a cohort of patients of 42 male subjects with a mean age of 14 years, 62.5% um, of which um, participated in a season of organized sports. And um, in the study, they outlined the different types of sports. And just for interest's sake, um, I ranked and went through each sport that they were participating in. And most patients, with the exception of one, were participating in sports that were either categorized or as a 2.5 or a 3 on our category scale. So these individuals were participating in significantly higher impact sports that would have previously been recommended as not appropriate for people with bleeding disorders. And the other 47.5% were served as the control group for this cohort because they didn't have any participation in sports. 
And so what their outcomes were, their endpoints were injuries such as soft tissue, hemarthrosis, muscle hemorrhage, and head injuries. And in the results, they found that there was no statistically significant difference in the mean number of injuries or target joint formation, which they defined as um, ble bleeding of three, of, of three or more times in the same joint over the six-month period. Um, between the subjects who participated in the organized sports compared to those who did not. And so um, that gives us a little bit of information um, about what people are actually doing. And in another study, just to, to give some more uh, depth to the conversation, um, in Broderick et al., they um, investigated um, physical activity and the risk of bleeding in a larger sample, 104 boys, and they actually followed these boys for a year. And what they did is the boys um, would have to log bleeding episodes, and the study investigators would contact them within six hours of six business hours of when they received the alert um, that they had had a bleed and they asked the boys to recount what they did in the eight hours previous to recognizing the bleed, um, the t 24 hours prior to that and then 48 hours prior to that and they looked back at the activities that these boys were involved in along with when they gave themselves their factor and tried to look at um, the relationship between physical activity to bleed risk. And so what the results of this study found is they found that boys who were t participating in category one, so what we would consider our green sports or our lower impact sports versus category two sports had an odds ratio of 2.7 and are the category one sports versus three, our high impact sports, had an odds ratio of 3.7. So basically what that shows us is there's a small, but it was seen to be a very transient increase in risk in boys who were participating in these higher impact sports. But just to illustrate from an absolute risk um, in this cohort of patients, um, for a child in this cohort over the course of the five years who was exposed based upon their physical activity patterns, they were participating in Category 2 activities uh, at least two times per week and Category 3 activities at least once per week. And the data was only able to associate one of those bleeding episodes with physical activity. So what that lend lends us to say that these boys were extremely physically active um, in level two and three activities, but only one of five were actually uh, showed a relationship to the physical activity, and four out of the five, um, they couldn't find that, that link. There are some limitations to this study. It was self-report for patients, and obviously, you know, they may not necessarily have accurately displayed what they were doing in those hours beforehand, but it just gives us a little bit of information um, in, in following the year. And then just to talk a little bit about joint outcomes in sport active boys. And so the impact of sports and physical activity levels in joint outcomes. In this study by Ross et al, there was 37 children with severe hemophilia A um, or B receiving factor prophylaxis. And 73% of this cohort of boys were participating in category three activities. And only and 27% were participating in what we would consider low impact or category one activities. And the results from the study found that joint hemorrhages and new injuries did not appreciably differ between the high and low impact athletics. So the level of impact of athletic participation was not a prognostic factor for joint outcomes. And then in the last little study that I'm going to talk about is looking um, in a study by Tatinsky et al. They looked at levels of physical activity correlated with bleeding profiles. And in this group, um, what they were able to demonstrate through their cohort of boys, 25 of which participated in strenuous activity and nine in non-strenuous, is that there was no significant difference in bleeding frequency or pain, but there was a significant difference in terms of the cause of the bleed, and so the mechanism of bleed. So the boys who were less active bled as frequently as the boys who were more active, but the boys who were less active had more bleed of unknown origin, and the boys who were more active were able to correlate their bleed to a direct trauma. And I just wanted to draw your attention to this abstract. I know you can't really see any of the words there, but this was an abstract that was just presented in Belfast at the World Federation of Hemophilia Musculoskeletal Conference. Um, it was uh, presented by one of my colleagues and CPHC member Sandra Squire, who's um, unfortunately not with us today, but I just wanted to 
to, um, along with that evidence, looking at universal limits and really that the literature doesn't support this categorization of sports as actually demonstrating um, increased risk in terms of joint outcomes and bleeding frequency. Um, what she tried, to, what she did with her study is looked at physical activity in adults with severe hemophilia and what happens after a year of prophylaxis. So in this research, um, it was this, the initial results on the first eight patients that came through the study, it investigated if a long-term individualized prophylaxis regime would increase physical activity in adults' patients with hemophilia. So what she did is she measured physical activity using accelerometry, and then patients underwent an individualized pharmacokinetic trial of their factor prophylaxis and received intensive support from the nursing colleagues for their individualized prophylaxis, and they followed that for a year. And all Sandra did was she measured their physical activity before they started individualized prophylaxis and 12 months after. And what she found was there was clinically, um, clinical meaningful differences between the two po time points. Without any instruction from, um, from her in terms of, uh, of the physical activity exactly and what they should do, every single patient in this cohort increased their physical activity as a result of their prophylaxis regime being individualized to their specific uh, pharmacokinetic needs. And so um, I just want to play a little video um, that just talks a little bit about this study and one of the patients that, uh, so hopefully this, this works with our AV people over there. After 59 years of life with hemophilia, Tim Ireland has seen many advancements in his care. But it's this daily injection of Factor VIII, an essential blood clotting protein that prevents him from severe internal bleeds that can be crippling, which has given him an almost normal life. Does it matter which arm I use? I want to use this one. While Ireland has been using Factor VIII as treatment after a bleed for many years, the preventative daily dose is new. And it was his nurse who first made the suggestion, even though there wasn't a lot of hard data yet. School is lost, work is lost. There's a great deal of pain involved when they get a, a joint bleed. They can't even put weight on it. It takes we sometimes weeks, days to weeks to, to recover from one. So to, to prevent that is just um, a win-win. Before you see the rest of the team, I was just going to go over with you a little bit. Cal McIntosh uh, and a physiotherapist were able to launch a one-year study of the prophylaxis approach thanks to a $4,000 scholarship from Providence Health and its innovative research challenge. It's a program designed to get frontline health care workers involved in research directly related to their own practice. It's the most fun thing I've done as a nurse is to lead these projects. It's just you get to work with a whole bunch of enthusiastic people who are very curious but they want to explore the question with some rigor. They don't want to just ask a question and get answers that aren't going to make sense. Ultimately, the research translates into better care for patients such as Tim Ireland. The retired teacher has been able to keep active without all the pain and suffering. Oh, there was uh, wheelchairs, there was there were braces, there was you know, long, long stays in the hospital, uh, prohibition from physical activities, and so it's been quite a change for me. Of the 43 projects that have been funded, several have led to practice changes. Hemophilia patients across the country are now following the daily dose protocol. For more than 100 bleeds a year, Ireland hasn't had one in more than one year. The life expectancy of a hemophiliac when I was growing up uh, was well, not much more than 20. Now they do study on uh, aging hemophiliacs, which I'm proud to be one. Elaine Young, Global News. So I think that um, the video and along with what Craig talks about is, is that we really need to individualize our approach to physical activity. And um, my next slide... So I think when we're looking at universal limits is that we really need to, they're not the best way to dictate which sports are appropriate for all patients with hemophilia. And really the research literature that I presented today demonstrates that as well. And so what do I think that the, the solution, where do we go from here? And, um, you know, Craig did an amazing job because I think that he really empowers what it is to be a critical thinker. And so I think we really need to empower our patients to be critical thinkers about the types of physical activities that they're involved involved in. He, he's developed a very thought out approach to his physical activity, how he implemented it, the types of activities he did within his joint disease. And so we need to empower our patients. We need to have them to think about physical activity needs to be part of their everyday. They need to be thinking about many 
parameters of physical activity along with you know their factor levels things that are there but when they get presented with an opportunity for physical activity think about you know what what's my what's my joints feeling like today um, is this a good sport choice for me today how can I make it safer for myself what what equipment can I use? What modifications can I use? Because we really want patients to be making these decisions. You know, we want them to come to us for guidance and so that we can discuss it with them about the appropriate treatment schedules. And But we really need to impart knowledge to them so that they can be critical thinkers and can bring this out in, into their own life, um, as Craig has shown, um, and then work with us as teammates to know about the knowledge of disease and any repercussions of bleeds. And so moving forward... Um, uh, the, the physiotherapy group in Canada um, is we're looking at revamping some of the physical activity recommendations and um, sort of rewriting the book when it looks at physical activity and moving away from this theory of universal limits when looking at risk and trying to um, piggyback on some of the things that we're seeing with individualized prophylaxis so that we can start making a really individualized approach to physical activity choices in patients with hemophilia. So... Thank you very much. Yeah. Are there any questions now? No? I don't know if we have uh, time for questions, but we may be able to take one really quickly. Um, in the studies that you reviewed in that literature search, you showed a kind of a variable relationship between physical activity and bleeds. And I'm sure it was in there. You, I don't think you told us how many of those studies used um, prophylaxis before engaging those type two point category two point five and three activities. Yeah, and so um, all of the patients were on some kind of prophylaxis regimen, um, but only the one study that um, showed the small transient increase uh, was the only one that actually measured any kind of factor levels. And they found that with every 1% rise in factor, the incidence rates of bleeds decreased by 2%. But that was the, every other study had just simply stated that patients, while on study, followed the normal prophylaxis regimen as prescribed. So the one that showed, one, for example, had um, significant 3.7, whatever it was. Yeah, that's ratio. the study that did the dosing as, that, as well. So it's hard to know whether the conclusion really is you can do category three as long as you take prophylaxis before so, or not. Well, we don't but know the answer they also, to that. Well, they also correlated that. They also measured dosing at the same time. And so they looked, they, they, in that study they did, they had some PK testing, and they say even when they controlled for the, for the factor levels at 8 hours, 24 and 48, the odds ratio was still greater for those who participated. And it was a very small, transient, increased risk. Yeah. Hi, thanks Hi. for your presentation. Uh, Leo from Sick Kids. It's a plug-in for a poster that we, we have out there. Uh, perhaps an attempt to us to get closer to individualized recommendations. Uh, we're using a high-resolution, uh, high-speed video technique to actually film different sport modalities. And you can quantify the number of uh, traumas that occur according to sport modality. As well, if you calculate distance and time it took, you can try to see forces, infer forces uh, associated to each trauma. So this is yet a feasibility step of it but perhaps it will be a step forward into us understanding, depending on sport modality, the number of trauma that occur and in the future, hopefully clinical meaningful trauma using this video technique. And is that in joints of patients with any arthropathies or is it? Well, we have to validate the technique first. Yeah. So initially the feasibility part was done in healthy children. In healthy controls. And yeah. then depending on how the technique evolves, we could translate into specific uh, populations. Great. Great. Okay, thanks. And considering who she is, I'll let her go. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> Hi, it's Kathy from Physiotherapy. Uh, just a quick comment. I think when we talk about risk and sport and activity, we need to talk about, there's two different ways that that can be measured. And I think this is really important for the parents and the families and the patients to consider. One is the incidence or the likelihood that you're going to get injured. Mm -hmm. And one is the type of injury that you are likely to occur if you do get injured. So for example, it's not unusual to get a jammed finger in basketball. Often, big deal. 
in boxing, the objective is to knock one another out. That is brain damage. That's a big deal. So it, it's, it, you really need to consider both factors when you're talking about sports selection, and that's one of the things that makes it so complicated to try and come up with a, any kind of list. All right, so I think we'll move on. Sorry. Oh. Can, I, can I actually just make one, ask one quick question? Yeah, yeah considering who I am. Uh, considering so, who you are. Um, <laughs> Uh, my, my question actually is, you know, looking at the data, I, you know, I'm a bit compelled by it and it's interesting, but I guess my underlying question is, what's the aggregate long-term impact of those level three um, yeah. sports? Because I'll just use my own example, you know, when they finally opened up my knee to replace it, the surgeon, I only really had one major bleed my whole life. but the micro bleeds that were happening in that knee over my 30 year lifespan at that point in time um, created much more complexities, much more problems than that were there. So you're not really completing the full piece of that puzzle. Um, and so I'm, I'm a bit concerned on how that was presented because well, there are long term consequences to the choices that we do make, right? Right, but we don't, because most of these these studies were in, were in boys who had access to prophylaxis, and um, we, there's, there is no long-term data yet in looking at that. So I think you know somebody who maybe have treatment on demand and then prophylaxis and then outcomes are going to be very different than people who've had access to prophylaxis and have been able. You know, been able to participate in sport and develop healthy musculoskeletal systems because that also helps decrease the risk of injury. So we've got a cohort of boys uh, or young men that we're just learning from, but yet none of the studies demonstrated any any long term outcomes beyond a year. Yeah. All right. So we'll move on just in the interest of time. Great discussion, and I'm sure there'll be many more discussions about this topic in future. Uh, so next, I'm going to introduce uh, Joanne Nielsen, who's a physiotherapist from uh, Saskatoon, uh, and Jeff Snow, who is a patient, a young man with mild hemophilia from Newfoundland. Very proud to say. Um, <laughs> so uh, just to go back to Joanne, Joanne has uh, been an active member with the Canadian Physiotherapist in Hemophilia Care for quite some time, um, a very active member, and currently holds a position as the vice president of the group. Uh, she's received many awards and grants. I will list a few of them here. Um, the Care Until Cure grant in 2006, uh, where she took a lead role in researching patients with mild hemophilia. 2011 and 2014, uh, she, along with Kathy, Kathy Mulder, received the Bayer Hemophilia Program Award. Uh, in 2014-15, they received the CHS uh, Baxter Inherited Bleeding Disorders Fellowship for Nurses and Allied Health Professionals Grant. It's very hard for Newfoundlander to say all those words nicely. <laughs> uh, and in December 2014, uh, she launched the, uh, the mobile app uh, known as Hurt, which many of you have heard of. Um, and it was launched in Winnipeg and Saskatoon. Uh, and this um, program received the Connected to the Community Award from the Mass, or sorry, from the uh, Canadian Wireless Telecommunications Association. Uh, she is a Master of Science candidate at University of Saskatchewan, uh, and her thesis is around discussing the influence of the mobile uh, app HURT uh, on young men with mild hemophilia. And I will ask you, there is a yellow sheet in front of you. I don't think we had enough to go around, so if you feel compelled to, we ask you to fill it out. Um, if you don't have one in front of you, if you see one um, that's left from later, Kathy or Vanna here will put them out for you. <laughs> um, if you could please fill that out, we would appreciate that. So um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to uh, Joanne Nielsen. All right, um, thank you for giving me a chance to um, talk about HURT. If everybody, if they have filled those out, um, you're not supposed to fill them out after this presentation. You're supposed to fill them out prior to. You can just send them down to the middle, and uh, Kathy will pick them up, and that would be great. Um, yes, HURT is a hemophilia injury recognition tool, and... Um, um, here's my speaker disclosures, and I think um, Colleen has already reviewed those. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I am going to talk about HURT, uh, a little bit about the background, what it offers, and I'm just delighted today because I have just met Jeff Snow, and he's going to um, talk a little bit about his experience as a young man with mild hemophilia, 
And I will give you a little bit of about my preliminary results with the interaction with HERT. Um, what I've, I've um, interviewed a few young men with mild hemophilia and it's always interesting when I do talk to them because a theme that is starting to come out, well, we'll to we're told it's mild, it's okay. So that theme is still coming from these young men. And um, another thing, uh, one young boy I recently talked to, he said, I was so surprised when I had my first bleed. And he didn't have, these guys are often diagnosed late. So he had his first bleed, I think at 19. And uh, the nurse, she told me I had a muscle bleed. And uh, I said, well, what do you mean? I'm not supposed to bleed. Like, I only bleed when you do surgery, right? That was my impression. And so I think, um, you know, that's a, that's a really big thing that we have to always remember with uh, young men with mild hemophilia. And actually, he went on to say that he was actually offended when he realized he had a bleed. He was, he was uh, yeah, it was very interesting. So anyway, um, our study started way back um, uh, many years ago. Uh, we, um, just with a brief definition, mild hemophilia is... 5 to 40 percent as, um, as written up uh, by in the study in 2014 in uh, the Journal of Thrombosis and, and Hemostasis. Our age group has kind of been 18 to 35 and um, that number of 1,700 males within that age group is from the CHARMS data from 2012. The inspiration for this um, project actually came through the CPHC, and that's why these meetings are very important. I think all of, as physios, we all sat around and said, oh, I've got a story for my clinic, and I have a story for my clinic on injuries that did happen with young men with mild hemophilia that were reported um, too late. And the hockey player there is often these guys are playing those level three sports. And um, they get away with a lot of injuries. They are physically fit. And they don't always bleed with those, with those activities. And in the, the young man that um, I'm referring to here, it wasn't his hockey playing that caused him any trouble. It was um, a skidoo accident that he walked away from, but it was a delayed reaction to um, getting his uh, medical attention. Um, so in our, our first study, we interviewed 18 young Canadian men within our age group, and we wrote this up in hemophilia in 2012. But what we found, these young men with mild hemophilia told us that they mostly ignored the, fi the advice of the existing Canadian hemophilia teaching materials, and they really didn't think that they were relevant to them. Uh, they would ask their brothers, cousins, and cousins for advice about the injuries before they would talk to the HTC staff. Um, and they did participate in those non-hemophilia approved sports and activities, and most of the time they had no injuries that needed treatment. And the big key here was they weren't always sure which bleeds needed treatment. So our research suggested that um, young men with mild hemophilia should be given credit for their own experiential learning. Not every risky activity can cause an injury. Not every injury will have major consequences. And some injuries do resolve without treatment. We needed input from these young men um, with mild hemophilia to develop the suitable tools that would be useful and relevant for them. So this was way back when I think Kathy and I were in the airport. This was written on a napkin. We thought, well, what kind of pathway will work? Um, the process of this went into a uh, pathway that we delivered to a fellow that um, developed it into an app for us. And uh, so we have partnered um, with young men. We took it back to the young men, and they really liked that they could apply first aid, wait and see. Now they knew what to watch for and what, what they could um, use that would indicate a problem, but they asked, is there an app for that? So through um, some of the uh, further research grants we've had, um, this self-assessment tool called HERT, which is Hemophilia Injury Recognition Tool, um, and it is available on your smartphone. How we did this, we did collaborate with um, the University of Saskatchewan Computer Science Department. Um, I have kind of um, used my funds to go through um, uh, MyTax 
uh, which is an industry partnering with universities, and they will be able to give us an internship program with a PhD PhD student in our computer science department. So we've gone back to these young men. They've said, yes, it's good. And actually, um, what, it, what it does is it's re readily available for the young men with mild hemophilia on their smartphones. It assists with the assessment of signs of musculoskeletal injury. It encourages the use of first aid as needed. Um, alarms the young man to reassess at intervals of one hour, one day, and two days, and it directs the young man to call the HTC if the symptoms worsen. So it was really interesting talking to Dr. Val, uh, listening to Dr. Valius this morning, because he talked about medical management, and we're trying to convert that to self-management. So this um, tool um, is an intervention um, tool that is, is trying to promote self-management in the young man with mild hemophilia. Here's some screenshots. So on the, on the far um, left-hand side, it goes through the parameters of what you might see in a joint um, injury, pain, movement, um, warmth, and swelling. And then you go on to encourage first aid, it reminds you, and then it has all the HTCs of all of Canada listed there, and you can phone directly from your app. So it was launched jointly in Saskatoon and Winnipeg in December, and it's available free through Google and Apple stores. It's available in French and English, and all the information is on the CHS website as well. So it is available for free download, and we haven't limited that to the young men with mild hemophilia, because it has a great assessment tool in it as well. Um, so we don't mind if people download it and just explore as well. Right now, I would like to um, introduce Jeffrey Snow from Newfoundland, a young man with mild hemophilia, and um, uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his experience um, as being a young man with mild hemophilia and his interaction with, um, with HERT. So Jeff, would you like to stay there or would you like to come up here? I'd like to stay right here, thank you very much. Okay, perfect. You, you take over. So I want to start off by saying uh, thank you to you, Joanne, for having me here, for having this discussion. And I would also like to say it's Newfoundland, not Newfoundland. <laughs> <laughs> but it's common misconception. <laughs> so unfortunately, every hemophiliac has horror stories. As you know, said in previous um, discussions here today, and I'm no different. A couple years back, I had something going on with my left ankle. There was swelling, there was redness, there was heat. I had restricted range of motion. I had the inability to weight bear on it anymore, and it was a constant throb of pain, usually the symptoms of a bleed. And we treated it as a bleed, we infused, uh, we left it for a little bit, but nothing happened. Uh, a little bit later, Colleen herself actually diagnosed it as something much more than just a bleed. It ended up being an infection, which put me on crutches for almost a month, actually, IV antibiotics, and that infection actually returned. And the big problem about it was we thought it was a bleed, but it turned out it wasn't. And having this app is something that might clear that up. If I had known that it wasn't quite a bleed initially, uh, one, we could have resolved it much sooner. Two, the infection might not have gotten as bad as it did, and it might not have returned. And three, I mean, there might have been some soft tissue damage occurring in my foot because the infection was spreading up my leg my entire foot was purple. It was not very pleasant to look at. But regardless, I took maybe 1,000, 2,000 units of cogenate, which really didn't do me much good. So, you know, young people nowadays, everyone's got a phone. You really won't see any youth today that isn't just looking down, thumbs going. And the same thing with some adults today too. Everyone has a phone and everyone has it on them at all times. So if you have this app, 
it's essentially like a resource that's there all the time if something happens, uh, if you have questions, you don't even need to do an assessment. Built into the app is locations for HTCs all over Canada, contact information, and whatever you need, really. And I also think one of the benefits of having this app is new parents. It presents you with you know, symptoms to look for for bleeds, which eventually becomes routine. You know the steps, you know the signs, and you know what needs to be done. But go back to the beginning, where you might not even know how to spell hemophilia yet. And even then, it does not matter how much information you're given, until you get into practical application, you might just blank entirely and have no idea what to do. And where I live in Newfoundland, I am in a very central location. Uh, we have two essential uh, city sensors, one in the far east, St. John's, and one in the far west, Cornerbrook. Not 100% about there being an HTC in Cornerbrook, but I do know there is an HTC in St. John's. But for me, it's a four-hour drive either way. And the problem with that is, one, whatever's happening, is that worth the four-hour drive to get to an HTC to get a little bit more information and a checkup? And the decision you have to make is, okay, if we go, it might not be worth it, but if we don't go, we might have a very big problem. And I think that this app could really help clear that up and could prevent a lot of injuries. Um, I remember one person from today said, it gets better. But it took a while for that to get better. Maybe if we could use this as a tool to make it better faster, I think that would help. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you being involved. I just want to, um, from, from the time it's been released till now, we've had 27 downloads on Google Play, and I can track that, which is kind of exciting, and about 80 at the Apple Store. And what I'm really finding is the young men that I have talked to have said that their confidence level in knowing what to say to the nurse when they call them has really improved. You know, uh, they said I was about a five having hemophilias because it's still kind of unknown to me because it's my normal. But when they have the app to check the balances, they felt that they're, they had improved to about an eight. Um, and that's on a level of one to ten. Another one was with the reminders. Um, one fellow, he used to uh, want to ignore his injuries. He'd hop on the couch and watch a video game. But if he had started the app, had a look, the app would remind him, and then he would check again before he had stayed there too long and the bleed had gotten out of control. So our HURT team has been um, quite a number of physiotherapists, Kathy and I included on the top, and um, some people from the University of Saskatchewan, our app developers, but most, um, most importantly, the young men with mild hemophilia. Thank you. Thank you.